So in part of our discussion of abstract base classes, we want to come back to some code we had written in CSA called the dog code. Let me just show you what that looks like right now. So we have this dog class over here, and we have a tester class that creates a couple of dogs and prints them. If I just run this tester class right now, you can see, yes. I'm just uh, stalling for time here, miss. So you can see I've created two dogs and I've printed them out here. And uh, there's nothing exciting going on. Now, I don't know if you remember back in CSA, but we then showed uh, inheritance here by creating different types of dogs and having them all inherit from the dog class. Do you remember that? So uh, in the interest of time, I won't build them all out. I'll just build two of them today. So the first one I'll build is the poodle. And there's the poodle class right there. And we said that the poodle is going to be identical to the dog. So we'll just say extends dog. I'll put my name and today's date in here as a good habit. And I'm going to get rid of this boilerplate because I don't need it. And with just this one feature, with this extends feature, I'm able to inherit from the dog. And I'm going to inherit all the methods except for one group of methods I don't inherit. What are the methods I don't inherit when I do inheritance in Java? Who remembers? Mr. Franovic, the constructors are not inherited. So you can see it'll inherit, it'll inherit these variables. It'll inherit the two string. It'll inherit the getters and the setters, but it will not inherit the constructors. You have to write your own constructors. Yes, sir. Um, if you have a private method, it doesn't do that to you, right? Uh, as strangely, it inherits the method, but doesn't let you use it. It's kind of a weird sort of a way of saying it. Yeah. Yeah, you could post it on Google Classroom. I should have done that. Yeah. So anyway, getting back to my poodle here, you can see that's all I need to create the poodle class. And I can just hit the uh, compile button on that and it works fine. And if I go over to the tester now, uh, and I was to create a poodle and print it. So let's do that. I go uh, poodle uh, p equals new poodle. And uh, then I go p dot set name uh, poly the poodle, right? And now down here I can, um, I can print all the information about Polly also. So here, I'll just put Polly in there. And now if I run this puppy, I'll print information about all three dogs. And there's Polly right there. Okay, that's the poodle. Notice that Polly knows how to print itself because it inherited the two string. And I didn't set the age and the weight, so they got defaulted to zero. But Polly, I set the name, so there it is. Now I'll create one more kind of dog. We'll create a beagle dog. And here's the beagle. I'm going slow enough so that even if you haven't got your code yet, you should be able to catch up with me. I haven't actually taught any new material yet today. So in here, uh, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to delete this boilerplate. I'm going to extend dog. And who remembers last from last year, uh, how is a beagle different from a regular dog? Does anybody remember? Yes, sir. They howl. they howl. So I don't know if I remember to put the speak method in the dog class. Let's see. I think I might have forgotten to do that. So let's put the speak method in the dog class here. So I'm going to go uh, public void speak. And this one here is going to say wolf. There is the regular dog speaking. The poodle will also say wolf, by the way, because it's going to inherit the speak method from dog. Now, the beagle would inherit the speak method, except I'm going to turn it off and replace it with my own speak method. So override public void speak. This is just a quick review of inheritance for you. And here I'm going to say system out print ln howl. And what's happening here is that the beagle, the beagle is going to be just like a dog in every respect, except when it's its turn to speak, it's going to say howl instead of woof. So now if I go into the tester code and make myself a beagle, I'll make the beagle right here. If I speak, if the beagle speaks here, uh, 
you'll see that it will make a howling sound instead of a woofing sound. So there you can see the beagle is making a howl instead of a woof. So that is a quick review for you on inheritance and the dog code. So far, I've just reviewed what we learned in CSA. Let me ask the question, is there anyone who is not caught up with the dog code now? Tell me the truth. I'll wait again for you. Everyone's caught up? Okay. Poodle's trivial. Okay, and here's the beagle in case you need it. All right, we're going to get started now. Now the new lesson starts. So look at over here in my tester code. Can you see that I can create dogs, poodles, beagles? I can, anything that inherits from dog, I can make them, right? Let's say as a designer, you, to, you told your users, I only want you to make breeds of dogs. Don't create any dogs. Like don't, don't do this. Like if you want to make a dog, you have to pick a breed. How would you enforce that from a computing standpoint? That's the question I have for you today. And the answer is you would use something called an abstract base class. So to make a class abstract, let's say I want to make this class abstract. What I do is I put a keyword in here. Can anyone guess what the keyword is I use? Yes, sir. Right. So I just go like this. Once I do that, I can no longer actually construct dogs anymore. So look what happens now. This code will compile fine, but look what happens now when I try to compile the test code. You see that? The compiler complains and says, hey, you can't make a dog. A dog is an abstract entity. So what I'm doing basically is I'm removing the ability to use the keyword new with the class by making it abstract. So I'm telling the user, if you want to use the dog or you want to make a dog, you got to pick like a poodle or a beagle or some other inherited class from dog. But dog itself, you can't make. It's, it's, it's abstract. I added this one word. That's all I did. Okay. Now, there are some other advantages of abstract classes. For example, let's say that I was to take this method now and instead of writing it, I just went like that. You notice, oh, I have to tell it it's abstract. And so what, what is, this is saying now is not only is the dog abstract, but if you inherit from dog and you're a concrete class, you are required to write this method. You're required to write it. In other words, now question, what class did we write before is going to break now? Yes. Poodle's going to break now. It said, hey, you're supposed to be inheriting from dog, and you're required to write the speak method. Now, I can fix this in one of two ways. I can either add the speak method like this. Okay, that's one way to fix it. Yes, sir. Could you pass the box the things that it sent? Yeah, I'm going to show you that now. So uh, if I was to turn this off, another way to fix this would be I could go like this. Like that. And now what I'm saying is not only is dog abstract, but poodle is abstract also. So now I can pass the buck, as Ben has suggested, to some lower level class that inherits from poodle. Now, I want to be clear about this. If dog is abstract and poodle is abstract, if I want to, I could still write this code here and not pass the buck. See that? It's abstract, but I'm not passing the buck. I'm implementing the poodle uh, speak method. So this abstract business gives you some flexibility as to where you develop the methods. But by the time a concrete class is built, all the methods have to be declared and defined. Okay. I'm going to take this out now, and I'm going to say that the Poodle class is concrete. Uh, that's a term I haven't used before. All the classes you've written so far have been concrete. They have not been abstract. Concrete and abstract are opposites, okay? So here you can see dog is abstract. See, I use the word abstract here. And here, Poodle is not abstract. 
So what are the advantages of having abstract classes? Well, I like to think of it as an unfinished work of art. Like you may have a class that you have lots of these features, like the dog class has all these features you want to hand out to your users, but the, the class itself really shouldn't be made into an object. You need to you need to add more stuff to it that's unfinished. And so you can declare the class to be abstract and then any methods you want, you can have as many abstract methods as you want. You can also have any other methods that you want. Uh, basically, you can do whatever you want, do part of it and require the person who is inheriting from you to fill in the rest. Okay, so it's just a powerful concept here. Try to understand though that if it's abstract, what you can't do is in the tester code, you can't go like this anymore because that's what abstract means. You can't make it into a thing. Yes, Miss Milla? Everyone has the code? All right. So that is, in a quick nutshell, my lesson for you on abstract base classes. And that used to be a topic in CSA, and it was heavily tested on the multiple choice portion of the exam. But about four or five years ago, in order to make the curriculum simpler and to attract more students into CSA, they got rid of abstract based classes as part of the curriculum. So now I've moved it into data structures. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you a quick review on interfaces. And I'm guessing that some of you remember the lecture from last year and some of you do not. I gave you a lesson last year near the end of the year after the AP exam talking about how a group of engineers in China who design remote control systems might be working with a group of engineers in Japan, maybe at Epson who built that projector, and how the two of them can communicate with each other with something called an interface that will allow the engineers in China to tell the engineers in Japan all the methods they need to write for this remote control and to make sure nothing gets forgotten and have that entire system enforced by the compiler instead of by a lawyer, right? So instead of writing a Word document, trying to explain to the Japanese engineers, hey, you got to write this method and that method. Instead, you write an interface, you give the Japanese engineers the interface, and the Japanese engineers are forced to write the methods because if they don't write them and write them correctly, it won't even compile. And so the compiler is doing all the checking for you, and that's valuable. So that is what an interface looks like in Java. Now, the way I describe the interface, let's just have a quick look at it. I'm going to create a new interface right here. So I think there's an interface here. I'll call it remote control. And let's look at what an interface looks like. So you can see here, uh, this is the remote control interface. And here's an example of a method. Now, the, the remote control, is it an abstract concept when it's an interface? What do you think? It, it is abstract in, in, in the sense of, of, of how um, an English teacher means the word abstract. It, it is an abstract concept. You can't create a remote control object. You can't go a remote control RC equals new remote control because an interface is an abstract concept. Okay. And you can have as many methods here as you want. So you might, for example, have uh, like a power reset. Right, and then you might have, um, I don't know, I'm just making some stuff up. What would you else would you need for remote control? Maybe like a play button. Here's a play button. Uh, maybe uh, avoid uh, uh, a screen, uh, screen uh, set or something like that. You can have as many of these methods as you want. And anyone who implements the interface has to provide all these methods. That's the idea. It's just a little reminder from last year. Now in Java, it turns out that there are three types of interfaces, three types of interfaces. So let me take a little note here. This is a three types of interfaces in Java. The first type is called a is called a marker interface. And what a marker interface is, it's an interface 
that has zero abstract methods. See, these things over here are abstract methods. Th these are the rules for joining the club. An interface is like joining a club. If you join the remote control club, part of the rules of the club is you have to provide these three methods. But in a marker interface, it has exactly zero abstract methods. What does that mean in terms of the rules of the club? I'm sorry? What does it mean if you're if you are a marker interface and you have zero abstract methods? If you if you describe it like a club, what kind of club is it? What are the rules of the club? There are no rules. You just say I'm in the club and you're in the club. Now you might be wondering what kind of a crazy interface is that? It turns out that there are certain features in Java. The most uh, famous one is called uh, example is called serializable. So for example, if you create a class here and you mark it serializable, let me show you. Implements serializable. There you go. Implements serializable. It, that's, that's a marker interface. It basically tells the compiler, I want the dog to be serializable. And what that does is it means that you can put the dog to sleep and then uh, in some other program, wake it up again. Basically, it lets you write the dog objects to a file. Okay, this used to be part of the course, by the way, for data structures. One of the topics I threw out because it's got nothing to do with data structures. But this is an example of an interface. You can see it's an interface, not a class, because I'm using the keyword implements instead of extends. And what this means is I'm joining this club because I say so, but I don't have to write any methods. This gives it all kinds of special properties, allows the class to be written to a file and then woken up again uh, and, res and basically rejuvenated. So that's an example of a marker interface. Then going on with our interfaces still, another type of interface is called a SAM or functional interface. Uh, and this has exactly one abstract method. And I'll get back to that in a second. I'll talk about that in a second. And then the third type is going to be a normal interface, more than one abstract method. And most interfaces in Java that you build will be like this. They'll have more than abstract me one abstract method. Now, this one here, getting back to number two, the SAM, does anybody know what SAM is an acronym? What does it stand for? Anybody guess? Yes, I'm hearing it. Someone's saying it. Who is it? What is it? Mr. Ajoji, is that you, sir? No. Sorry. It stands for single abstract method. That's what it used to be called for many years, but then it got changed. The name got changed to functional. And the reason it got changed is that the software community. The software community came up with this new paradigm of programming called functional programming. And Java's way of doing functional programming is through SAMs. So they just decided to change it from SAM to calling it now functional so that everybody in the software community would understand what it means. And what it means is that you have exactly one abstract method. When you have an interface that has exactly one of these things, it, there's some additional advantages that you get because whenever you refer to the method of the interface, you know which one you're talking about because there's only one. And we'll see that later on in the year. But just trust me on this for now. This will become much more important as the last topic in June. Unfortunately, the seniors will probably be off on uh, internship, but the rest of us will stay behind and learn about functional interfaces and functional programming. So that is a quick review for you on interfaces. And now what I need to know is how much of this do you remember? What I'd like you to do right now is I'd like you to write a class called Epson Remote Control, and I would like you to implement this interface right here. Just make it do some weird stuff with some print statements or something. Please write a, uh, a class now that implements this interface. So I'm asking you to build a new class for me called Epson Remote Control that implements this interface.
Okay, so I'm going to go over here, say new class, and say Epson remote control. And then I'm going to come over here. And uh, is anyone finished already? All right. So, Mr. Uh, Mariak, sir, can you help me? Uh, sir, what do I put up here? Do I need anything here? Okay, implement remote control like that. Yes, okay. Now you can see uh, I need to implement these uh, methods here, power set, play, and screen. One thing I like to do is literally like to take these methods here and copy and paste them so that I know I got all the headers correct. And I'll just literally paste them in here like that. Now I need to change these uh, to like this. So I need to replace the semicolons with blocks and I need to put the, put the word public in front of each of these. Okay, so that would be an example of how I would implement it. Yes, sir. On this, I would say directly from the. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, you can. Um, if you're implementing like a replace, you can build the um, methods in the uh, That doesn't surprise me. Okay, very good. So, uh, as uh, Mr. Fanek was saying, if you're on Yield IntelliJ, you can have it implement the methods for you, and then you obviously will fill in the body yourself of each of the methods, but. It'll write all the headers for you. No shocker there, right? 